Well, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's in tomorrow's newspapers as they come into us. Over the next half hour, we're going to see what is making those headlines with the journalist and author Rachel Shabby and the political editor of the Sunday Express, Camilla Tomini. Before we jump into those front pages, let's take a look at some of them. The Observer, describing the jubilant mood in Zimbabwe as Robert Mugabe's time in power appears to be drawing to a close. The Sunday Times says Zimbabweans have united in their opposition to Mr Mugabe. The Sunday Express looks ahead to the budget, saying the government will announce a funding boost for artificial intelligence, which could see driverless cars on the roads within three years. The Sunday Telegraph says the Chancellor will also announce investment for the NHS and a pay rise for nurses. The Mail on Sunday says the Labour Party is investigating claims that one of its MPs threatened a colleague in the voting lobby after a debate on Brexit. The MP in question denies it. And the Daily Star on Sunday has a story about I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. So let's talk about some of those stories with Rachel Shabby and Camilla Tomney. Good evening to you both. Evening, How are you? you? Well, right, yeah. good. Um, let's get stuck into the Observer then. Robert Mugabe, it looks like certainly tomorrow morning is going to be the end for him, certainly within the ZANU-PF party, if not immediately ousting him as president. Um, scenes on the streets of Harare, Camilla, that would have been unthinkable even weeks ago. I know, I'm sure lots of people are looking at this story like us, kind of wondering how this has happened. You know, Mugabe's been in place for all those years and people have, I think, just basically been waiting for him to die, for there to be a transition. And then suddenly with a combination of obviously military might, although they're stressing it's not a coup, even though it is a coup, it's kind of a coup. and people power now backing them up, um, a change is afoot and expecting Mugabe to um, have to leave tomorrow. Grace Mugabe is still in Namibia, or she? So she's uh, escaped. Um, I mean, unprecedented scenes, a country that used to be described as the breadbasket of Africa, so thriving, and uh, now with seven in ten of its um, inhabitants in um, abject poverty. So, yes, a change is afoot, but of course, concerns about what comes next and how to preserve or how to make a silver lining out of a dark cloud, I think. I mean, Rachel, a lot of people in the streets uh, calling for democracy now. It seems like the removal of Mr Mugabe is, is really internal party politics in terms of what the immediate future holds. Yeah, and that's certainly what all the, um, the papers are reporting on tomorrow and and as we've heard you know people thronging the, st the streets of all, all the cities in Zimbabwe all day um, in support of the military hugging the military and um, saying that they want him to go but yes what happens next will be crucial he's supposed to be meeting with army officials tomorrow if he doesn't agree to step down it's thought that his own party uh, ZANU-PF will then depose him um, and then Parliament will meet in the week and say, well, you're out, you've gone. But then what happens next? Is there a transitional government? And if there is, who is there? Will it be just ZANU-PF? Will it be the opposition? Will it be MDC? Will Morgan Changarai come back? You know, these things are going to be crucial to, to de determine whether what fol follows is actually a democratic process. Mm. Camilla, I mean, this is a man who was born into a country under British colonial rule, led an uprising against that, um, and in his time as president has been accused of rigging elections, death squads roaming the streets. Will we hear much from him? after this do you think well who knows what is he now 90 93 93 um presumably a man of his stature and indeed arrogance will want to put his side of the story forward and try and rewrite history to a certain extent who'll take that account remains to be seen and how he will try and do it equally grace an equally um intriguing figure a figure now of hate and ridicule because of her excessive and lavish lifestyle in the face of the poverty facing many of her people um it's interesting, but it is the end of an era and hopefully the start of something much more positive. Um, there's some talk as well in some of the papers about this guy, the deputy, the crocodile, who has got his own rather mixed history, but the suggestion that he will end the diktat, which states that businesses and farms have to be run by 51% blacks rather than a mix of, of white and black, whether that will make a difference and indeed whether the farming industry of Zimbabwe in which it was once um, so successful will be reinvigorated now. Uh, let's move on to matters closer to home. Sunday Express headline, driverless cars by 2021. One of the announcements in Philip Hammond's budget we're hearing on Wednesday is going to try and get out in front of 
the future that's coming very fast. Uh, an industry we're hearing is going to be worth £28 billion by 2035. Artificial intelligence, Rachel. Yeah, this is, uh, actually this is Camilla's story on the front page of The Express, announcing that um, it's part of this multi-million pound plan that Hammond has to um, bring uh, Britain to the forefront of the technological future. Of course, Britain's main problem at the moment is that productivity has flatlined. It is uh, among the worst in the G7, um, and that's while we are working longer hours uh, for less pay and in worse conditions. So it's, it's, it's something that needs to be unlocked, this flatlining productivity. And of course, this technological change and investment in technology is, is something that's, um, you know, hope to unlock uh, Britain's potential and, and pro productivity. So that's the context in which, presumably, yeah. He's putting I mean, this out there. What's quite interesting about this drop, which has gone to all the Sundays in a bid to kind of keep us occupied with Brexit story, uh, with a budget, budget and Brexit stories that we can control, as opposed to making up stuff that might be in the budget on Wednesday, which is also the want of a Sunday newspaper journalist, um, is that there's the sense that actually Hamd is trying to ensure that those who have to go into post-Brexit Britain, enjoy some of the spoils if it's successful and if there's a sense that we can be a leading global player when it comes to technology. Interestingly, as part of these announcements, as well as funding things like AI, driverless cars, uh, better 5G connectivity, there's also funding to train 8,000 more computer science teachers. That's been welcomed by Eric Schmidt of Google, who has said this is the way we need to go forward. Also more training for older people to reskill because Obviously, the days of our old manufacturing, you know, Sheffield Steel and other things that might have been iconically British have gone. And there's a sense that we need to be more productive in a different area. I mean, so... there's, there's almost three quarters of a billion pounds investment here that he's announcing. Should he be stashing away some of that for a Brexit war chest? And this is uh, some of the criticisms that are already coming out from other elements of his cabinet who we see on the Telegraph front. Um, some people have been saying, well, actually, it's all very well talking about driverless cars, but we want to see Hammond produce a Brexit-proof, Brexit-friendly budget. We want him to uh, assure that our Brexit future um, is, is, is going to be a healthy and a robust one financially. But of course, that is the problem. Uh, whenever the Conservatives announce um, financial measures like this, they U-turn. You know, they've already U-turned on several things, for instance, housing. And the other thing is, of course, where they're, where they're going to fund it from. Is it going to be tax? Is it going to be borrowing? We don't know yet. And I mean, speaking... they'll announce that on Wednesday. To be fair, I think there are also a lot of housing measures expected. There's been suggestions that he's going to give a stamp duty cut to first-time buyers. Yeah. There's a suggestion that he's going but... to lift the cap on councils building social housing. There's a suggestion that he's going to lift the public sector pay cap when it comes to nurses. There's also been suggestions about soldiers' pay. I'd suggest that actually it's not just public sector pay that needs to be looked at, but also private sector. We have another piece in the paper from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation saying actually private sector wages, particularly for people in the retail and hotel and restaurant sector, have gone down in real terms by about 1.4%. So across the board, I think workers are feeling the pinch. And actually, at the end of the day, if you want people to spend more money, the only way they really do it isn't if they've got historically low interest rates on their mortgages or whatever. So they're more, it's if they're earning more. Which is, of course, what we've been arguing, which is, of course, the, the, the absolute premise of the anti-austerity argument and Phil Hammond has been very pro-austerity during his time as Chancellor and before. But even just taking those issues one by one, I mean, the housing thing, great. It's great to announce that they're building a commitment to build more housing, albeit that they've already U-turned on that commitment from the manifesto. But it depends what kind of housing you're building. Um, we need affordable housing. Now, if the definition of affordable housing for the Conservatives is what we've already seen, which is the entry level is 400,000, that isn't really going to fix the kind of problems and the housing crisis that the UK is facing. That's just one measure, and we need to see more detail well, I will see. on the rest. I think the housing, the, the, the cap on, um, lifting the cap on council's ability to borrow against their own assets is for social housing. I agree with you, we need to see, and also whether he's going to match Savage Javid's numbers. He wanted £50 billion to be spent. Not sure there's that money in the coffers. It certainly doesn't look like he's going to quite line up with what Sajid Javid is saying. Uh, turning from housing to this 
pay boost for nurses that the Sunday Telegraph have gone with on their front page. Public sector pay cap has been in place since 2013 for many people since two years before that even. Yeah. I note that the Royal College of Nursing have come out in response to this front page this evening by saying, we'll wait to see the details on Wednesday, but nursing staff need a pay rise above inflation and the government must give the NHS the funds to cover it. And that's the thing, that's always been the thing with um, the pay freeze for all public sector workers, not just nurses, although clearly we've heard a lot about nurses because we've heard that you know some of them are reduced to using food banks or to getting second jobs, but it has always been we need to see a rise in real terms because living costs yeah. have risen to the extent that in real terms the pay cut, the pay cap has been far more crippling than it would appear on the surface. So, yeah, we need to see more but detail. If they um, right, raise the um, pay cap, they get rid of it across the whole of the public sector. Are you happy for middle managers and NHS bosses to also be given a pay rise? I mean, I think this is the thing that the, the Conservative government has tried to do in the talks about um, uh, reversing the pay cap. They've tried to pick off. Uh, I'm just bits. wondering whether that's they've possible. They've tried to pick yeah. off different, sec different people in the public sector, so they've said, all right, frontline, you know, um, firefighters, um, we'll talk about you having it, but the backroom staff, not so much. So, and that's the thing, it actually has to go across the board for it to be meaningful in terms of not just their individual pay, but the kind of services but that they're if able you also, to the, offer. But the trouble is fiscally, isn't it? It's really difficult to, of course, frontline staff, and indeed the nurse who made the point with Theresa May in the debate before the election, I think, gained a lot of traction because people were looking at it going, yeah, well, why aren't nurses given more money? Mm. And I think there's huge sympathy for that. But there's also the realisation that a public sector pay rise across the board is hugely, hugely expensive. It's it also S means paying paying middle managers and NHS bosses more money. Yeah, Every hand I'm, I'm es saying... Estimated by the Institute of Fiscal Studies for around £4 billion a year, and that's just with, in line with inflation, not above every, inflation. So yeah. this, this is a huge amount. And also then what happens to private time, sector workers? I mean, private sector workers, you could argue, have, ha have been more disadvantaged than public sector workers. I think there's stats suggesting that their wage growth have been even lower if you look at it in real terms. I mean, it's such then a false economy to think of the money I mean, this, is, this has always been the Conservative problem: is that they haven't, they don't look at it in terms of what it means. The minute you pay well, you people, have to pay for the things. minute you pay people more, they pay more tax, they put more goods into, the, they put more money into the economy, arguably, they buy more, arguably, and then the economy is more the robust. The Conservative principle of taxing people less, and therefore they have more money to spend, which is obviously anti-Labour. Yeah, but, but again, so that's why it doesn't work. That's why well, we're much better off having a Labour party put this stuff into effect in government. Sorry, are you saying that taxing people less doesn't? Work. No, I'm simply saying to you that there's a failure for Conservatives to understand that if you pay public service sector workers more, not only are they better able to do their jobs in the public center, sector for this country, but they will then generate more income for the economy. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there for the purposes of time because we want to fit in as much as we can after the break. Still to come, apparently Eton are banning their pupils from using their phones in bed. More about that next. Welcome back to the press preview here on Sky News with Rachel Shabby and Camilla Tomini. Um, let's talk about this photo on the inside of the Daily Express. We were talking about it just before we started. I just Sunday took it Express, off. Tom. I have Sunday to correct Express. you. Sorry. Uh, apologies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, it is the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh's 70th wedding anniversary on Monday. This is a photograph that they've released for the Sunday papers. I believe there's another set of shots coming out in tomorrow's pa uh, Monday's papers as well. Um, and they are now the longest married couple in British royal history. They're having a dinner to celebrate on Monday night with family. And there's just a nice little line that Prince Michael of Kent is going to give to tomorrow night's Sunday uh, Song of Praise, talking about being a page boy at this wedding in 1947, back when he was just aged five and it's quite sweet really he talks about how the reading really lifted the mood of the nation in the aftermath of the second world war indeed the queen had to save up ration coupons to buy her wedding dress and it talks about how there was a complete obsession about not treading on her train at the time and having page boys and girls going flying down the um, Isle of Westminster Abbey so just a nice story and the fact that at 91 and 96 they're still going strong indeed
Yeah, and it's, it's, it must have been quite a responsibility. He's five, and he's talking about how heavy this train is and how long, how long they had to walk. He's quite proud. It's he says, that... "I was very well behaved." He remembers, but he says, "My memory's a bit sketchy because it was quite close to the coronation, and I had a role at that, and I mixed the two events up." So he's had a place in history. This bit of a blur. Um, <laughs> uh, talking about uh, Facebook in the Mail. Now this has been around for for quite some time, but this the Mail saying that Facebook has now admitted that Russian trolls targeted the website in the run-up to the Brexit referendum. Yeah, so this is the first time that Facebook has admitted what we've all wondered for a while, um, which is that it was all, also targeted by Russian trolls in the run-up to um, last year's Brexit referendum. We already know, I so think it was the Mail on Sunday, last Sunday, that had the news that, um, you know, there were troll farms in uh, Russia that were sending out yeah. um, hundreds, of messages. hundreds yeah. of messages on Twitter. And that was, it wasn't just necessarily pro-Brexit, it was divisive, it was, a lot of it was anti-immigration. And that's, and that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's the idea that it would um, stoke divisions or make those b views seem more, um, more in number than they actually were. So I think this is the thing that is driving um, MPs from both sides, from both parties. Yeah, I was just to... thinking, it's that image, wasn't it, as well, of the Muslim lady on the... her phone. Oh, she's ignoring the terror attack. At Westminster. Yeah, yeah. just nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting that Zuckerberg doesn't seem to want to address this issue. The, the chair of the... Um, committee that has sent him a letter, Damien Collins MP, says he hasn't even acknowledged this letter yeah. or replied, yeah. doesn't really seem to care. Well, I'm not sure if they, I mean, I think they just really don't know how to respond, do they? Um, they've been reluctant uh, for so long to take any kind of responsibility for the content that appears on Facebook. They've always said we're not, you know, we're not, we're a social platform, a social media platform, we're not news. Um, we're not responsible for the content in that way. Do they so need I'm to make sure themselves more responsible? It though? throws up all kinds do. of ethical And also people like YouTube, it? and there's some stories today about, you know, really dodgy parenting blogs where fathers have been sort of humiliating young children and it's on this platform and it's attracting advertising and it's just really immoral. Yeah. I mean, and some of these platforms are... Having said that, uh, Home Secretary was saying a few weeks ago at conference, you know, I think something like 400 hours of footage are loaded onto YouTube every minute or something. How do you keep track? I mean, I have just no idea. And there was that whole thing with Peppa Pig as well, wasn't there, that it was spliced with violent imagery. <laughs> Was um, it? And it was showing up, and it was like playing automatically on YouTube because yeah. it plays next. Awful, awful. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, how do you stop it? We don't have the time to even try and discuss it. Uh, let's finish <laughs> on something interesting. Eaton banning phones in bed to stop pupils losing sleep. Now, we all do it, don't yeah. we? We turn over first thing in the morning, late at night, have a look at the screen, don't we? And exactly. they're trying to, trying to sort it out. I love this because this is one of those situations where parental behaviour doesn't set the best example. <laughs> Often on my phone I'm going, will you get off your phones, children? <laughs> get off your phone, Mummy. Um, and it's a very good point. So the Eaton head here, of course, fully boarding, so they've got more control of it, saying after 9.30, no electronic equipment in the boarding rooms at all. This comes after, I think it was an independent girls' school a couple of weeks ago, the head there sent out a similar missive saying, please do not use your mobile phone as an alarm mm. clock. We don't want you just waking up and instantly having the phone in front of you and I think for young people that makes a pretty valid point. I think so yeah I think it's probably true for everyone though isn't it I mean I've, I've just got an alarm clock because for, for, for so long I've been doing exactly that using the phone as an alarm and that's the first thing you look at and then of course you get sucked into God, all kinds of things though. before you've even had it's a like coffee how are you supposed to cope? I know it's terrible. It is an well, addiction. Well Ethan yeah. will have to update us on the results of their research into not using phones after 9 30 p.m. Uh, we'll have to leave it there Rachel Camilla uh, you. you'll be back with us in the next hour so make sure you stay with us here on Sky News for now let's see what the weather's doing